Morning. Morning. How's everybody doing? Hey, I'm so glad you're here to worship with us today, and I'm really excited as we finish our series, Blockbusters in the Bible. Uh, This has been a really fun series. Uh, We've had the chance to use movies as a lens to look at various uh, passages in the Bible. So just to kind of review, the first week, Bud shared with us the epic type movie, and that's where you've got a good and a bad, and there's a struggle, and it continues throughout the movie. And he used, if we remember, the movie uh, Apollo 13 and their adventure trying to make it to the moon. And the scripture he looked at was Elijah's travels and struggles to find the Lord. Now in week two, Kevin looked at life-changing or transformational-type movies where the character in the movie, usually their life's not going so well, and throughout the movie it transitions into something better. And he used the Les Mis movie and the story of Jean Valjean. And it kind of went through how his life started out as a prisoner into where he was working for other people. And his verse that in the passage he looked at was the transition of Saul to the Apostle Paul. And then last week, Ned looked at the romantic comedy chick flick type movie. Chick flick, I got to do air quotes, sorry. Uh, And his movie that he looked at was uh, Sabrina, where it was two brothers that fell in love with the same woman. And it was an interesting struggle there. And his verse that he looked at was the love story of Ruth, how she'd been widowed and was purchased and fell in love. Now, I have to provide a disclaimer for all of the men that attended last week's service. And that is that there no uh, man card was harmed in the watching of a romantic comedy or a chick flick as long as it occurred at church. So just so you know that and you can feel comfortable about yourself as we continue in today's message. So the type of movie we're going to look at today, and I think our trailer earlier kind of alluded to this, is apocalyptic. Now, in an apocalyptic movie, the way these kind of work is you have, you know, the world's going great and then something dynamically and suddenly changes. And often it makes the world worse than what it was, much worse than what it was. And then you have usually a person or a group of people that are trying to learn to live and struggling through that new world. And throughout the movie, as the movie continues on or the show, the struggle continues. And then often near the end or towards the end of the movie, there's some sort of event or action that happens that gives them hope that somehow this new world may be okay. It may be an okay place to live. And that's kind of how the movie usually ends. So, you would check out this clip I'm not, I'm not infected I'm not infected please nothing happened the way it was supposed to happen six billion people on earth when infection hit I'm a survivor living in New York City I will be at the South Street Seaport every day at midday when the sun is highest in the sky.
That's pretty intense. Uh, now, to be upfront and honest, and I need to be upfront and honest with you, is uh, you need to understand that I hate scary movies, uh, which apocalyptic movies often can be. And, you know, I don't think any of us really like when bad things happen, especially when the world or even our world starts to change or crash in around us. You know, a few years ago, my wife for a date night uh, talked me into going to a movie, which I thought, oh, that's pretty fun. Kids aren't around. We'll go hang out. And the movie was called The Woman in Black. And it was the first movie by Daniel Radcliffe, who played Harry Potter after the Harry Potter series had concluded. So as you can see in the little promo uh, picture here, there's a, a scary figure behind him. Well, we go to this movie, and I didn't realize, didn't research it ahead of time, and I did not understand that it was scary. So I proceeded to spend what seemed like the next four to five hours of my life with my head in my hands looking at the floor, which is not the most comfortable position because, as you could see, the person kept scaring Harry Potter. And the only saving grace of the entire movie was there was a gentleman a few seats down that I think was enjoying the movie in the same way I was. He was enjoying the experience, and every once in a while, he would yell out as loud as he could, Use your wand, Harry Potter! Use your wand! And he did this throughout the movie. As it continued, you know, parts where it would become scary, he was screaming for Harry Potter to just do something with his wand to fix the whole situation. So as we're leaving, we kind of walk out together, and I elbow him, I say, hey, pretty good movie, wasn't it? He said, yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> so why we all, I think, in our agreeance that we don't necessarily like scary things and we want to avoid them, you know, I really want to invite you today to join me as we look at these apocalyptic type movies and the scripture that goes along with it. So today, I'm going to choose, even though I'm a scaredy cat by nature, to be brave and look at a new world, a post-apocalyptic world, as it's described by the Apostle John in Revelations chapter 21, verses 1 through 8. Now, to understand and kind of give some backstory, the book of Revelations was written as to give us courage, to give Christians courage that we're facing trouble. It describes and it paints a picture of an unseen battle between Satan and the church that is constantly going on. But the message that Revelations provides us is very clear, it's ver very precise, and it's meant for every Christian, you and I included. And that message is, in the end, when it's all said and done, Jesus Christ will be victorious. Amen. Every enemy of God will be defeated. Every kingdom will fall. Satan will be cast down. And the greatest enemy of all, death itself, will be vanquished. So before we even read one word, before we even begin to look at this passage, I have the most awesome and amazing news to share with you. And that is, in the end, God wins. No matter what you're going through, no matter if it's family issues, it's money issues, it's sickness, it's struggles, it's kid problems, whatever it might be. Heck, you could have had issues this morning. I don't know if on the way to church, maybe you and your spouse or your kids had an argument in the car before you got here. I don't know what challenges it are that you might be facing. But I do know that even if it doesn't get better, whatever those might be, even if from here on out in your life it's always a struggle, you and I can take assurance that because we believe in a God and we love a God and we choose to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that in the end, God wins and all this junk, all this garbage loses. And it's for people of faith that we can live in this victory. Amen? Dear Heavenly Father, I, I, I do not know all the issues and the problems and the challenges and the struggles that we face today, Lord. But you do. You know each and every one of our hearts. You know what pains we might have, what struggles we might have, what difficulties we're facing, Lord. And I ask that you just, for this period of time, clear our hearts, clear our minds. Let us hear the words and the understanding of what 
you offered us in your victory, that you win in the end, and we are able to enjoy in that because of our love for your son, Jesus Christ. I pray this time, and I love you, and I love your son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. So I'm excited. So let's look at the first package or first passage of Revelations 21. And it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. So what's happening here is the Apostle John is describing what he envisions as, if you will, this post-apocalyptic world where it has been made new and it has been changed and fundamentally transformed to something different than we've ever understood. You see, what's going to happen is God, the same God that in the beginning created the world, made it new, is going to do the same thing again. He's going to take our world of brokenness and make it a brand new world all over again. And this new world, it's going to be perfect. It's going to be free of the sins and the pains and the struggles and the frustrations that we all endure now. And it's going to be rid of all the sin that causes these issues. But as I was preparing, as I was looking at this verse, the last part of it, if we can bring it back up and take a look at it here, it says, there is no longer any sea. Now, for those that know me, one of my most favorite things in the world to do is to go to the beach and sit and watch the ocean and go fishing and just play in the water. And I thought, well, that seems concerning to me. I kind of like a new world, but with no sea, I'm going to be kind of frustrated. And I don't think the Lord will be happy with me if I'm frustrated about a new world not having ocean. So in researching, what I found out was that the sea represents, in Revelations, it represents chaos. It represents hum human rebellion. It represents sin. It represents evil. It's where the enemies of God rise up against him. It's where sin and wicked people and nations all do their bad work. So when John says, in the end, there was no longer any sea, he's saying that all of that, all the evil, all the wickedness, all the sin, will be washed away as part of this new world. It'll no longer exist. So it's very simply to say, in the end, God makes everything new. Now, this isn't like the apocalyptic movies. It isn't like we're all going to be in a new world and there's going to be buildings just crumbled around us. There's going to be cars out of gas. There's going to be things crawling at us on the ground that some of us might feel the need to shoot. No, that's not going to be what happens. And it's not like we're going to be short of water and food and we're going to be struggling to find those things. In the end, just like it was at the beginning, God is going to make it all new, brand new and perfect. And as the verse continues, it gets even better. It says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their, be their God. In this verse, the city of Jerusalem, or this new holy city of Jerusalem, what it represents is a new world where God, our God, our almighty Savior, will be living among us. And it, all, it represents, you know, what is this? It's the church. It's the church of Jesus Christ. It's you and I. It's every person from every nation of every tongue that believes in the Lord and Savior will be in this place, living with our God, in person, be able to walk up and talk to him and share that experience. So what, you know, what we see here is that in the end, God will be with us perfectly. Now, have you ever needed God or felt like you needed God? And no matter what you did, no matter how much you chased after him, kind of like Elijah that Bud talked about in week one, no matter how much you struggled and tried to find him, you just couldn't get there? Or it was a period of your life where you're praying and you're praying and you're consistent and you're constant and no matter how much you pray, it feels like no one's listening? 
One of the best things about this, one of the most awesome things about this idea that God will be there dwelling with us is that that all goes away. Your Lord and Savior will walk right next to you, and any concern, any issue, any pain, any trouble that you have, you will be able to talk to your Lord and Savior directly and have him comfort you, just like he did in the beginning with Adam and Eve. Now, in our church today, we kind of experience this. You know, we have a good song or a great sermon, hint, hint, uh, you know, and we really feel the Lord, you know, there's, we feel the presence of the Lord. We feel the Holy Spirit. We raise our hand and say, dear Lord, I feel you, you're here. But it's just a glimpse. Just a tiny little picture of what it's going to be like in this new world. In this new world where we will live and we will walk and we'll be in perfect place with our Lord and Savior. Now, the next verse, it's, it's, it's one that's quoted quite often, and it continues on with these thoughts. And it says, He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things ha has passed away. See, in this new world, God just isn't going to make the world new and leave all these other things here, leave all the sin and the pain and the lingering effects here. No, when God makes this world new, all the stuff that troubles us today, all the stuff that makes our lives difficult today, all the frustrations and the pains and the sins and the sorrows, they're all going to be gone. It is going to truly, from every aspect, be perfect. Now, we all have our own stories. You know, we all can sit there, any one of you, we could ask, you know, what hurts you? What in your life has caused you problems? What right now today is your top list of 10 things that frustrate you, that upset you, that make you sad, that bring pain to your heart? And one day, one day in this new world, Jesus is going to make it right. The same Lord who was pierced to a cross, who lived a perfect life, and died for us so that us who believe in him can have the opportunity to be a part of this new world. One day, he is going to be in this place, and he's going to be able to wipe away those tears of pain. He's going to be able to wipe away our tears of regret, our tears of guilt, our tears of broken promises, our tears of loss and separation, our tears over what has been taken from us or what has been done from us our tears of loneliness, and even anguish. anguish. Check out this clip. I have been here. I don't think we've been here before, pal. You're your grandparents' pa, right? That's right. He's very nice. You saw my grandfather? Where did you see him? In heaven. I think the book has been powerful because of the perspective. It's coming from a child. I think people understand that the purest and best witness you're ever going to get as a kid, they're not contaminated with adult think. They don't know why things happen or how things happen, but they just say, this is what I saw. In heaven, this little girl came up to me, and she wouldn't stop hugging me. It was me. She wouldn't have a name. You guys didn't name her. Things like miscarriage, what we went through, is kind of a silent hurt, and no one knows what to say or how to talk about it. Some people think pastors have all the answers, and this one doesn't. Many times, searching for the answer, God, where does it say in the Bible that a miscarried kid, what happens? And here's this four-year-old that comes in with his pieces like a, in a puzzle. He brought them together, and now I can see this picture much more clearly about heaven than I ever could before. It just makes sense. It's beautiful. You know? What color is it? It's all the colors. All the colors of the rainbow in heaven. Except for him. But I never dreamed that three some odd years later, my son would meet my daughter. He would come back and, and share about her with us and my wife. I, I never even thought God would do that to heal my hurt. God only allows good things, but because there's evil in this world, bad things happen. But at the same time, God takes evil and he can turn it into good. 
We're in trouble here. He's much worse. Will you call some friends and pray for him? Reverend Bertha. Todd. Todd. Some of the hospital staff have said off the record that your son was not expected to survive. Use the word miracle. Do you believe he was in heaven? If he didn't die, uh, how could he see heaven? I don't know, but he did. The thing I'm most excited about is I think this movie is going to force people to ask themselves a question or two. We put off some of the most important questions until we're faced with mortality. This movie, I think, is going to cause people to ask the question, do you really believe what you say you do? Now, what we saw in the previous passage and kind of what that movie alludes to is that in the end, in this new world, God fixes the broken stuff. You know, and that kind of sounds like what I said before, where in the end, God makes it new. But this is even better to kind of give you an example. You know, we've all been there as adults, you know, where your child gets that new toy or you go out and you buy that new piece of furniture, and it comes in the box, and it's got like 875,000 pieces. <laughs> and you pull out the manual, and it's like war and peace. And you open it up, and I'm sure just like I do, and you do, you go to the page that has all the parts, and you sit there, and you take them out, and you count every one of them just to make sure they're there. I don't do that. I just kind of fib to you right then. I go open the book, and I go to step one, and I start into the process. And, you know, it's never on step two or step three or step four that you realize that of all the 400 million pieces you're supposed to have that you're missing something. Oh, no. Oh, no. You, you, are, you are four to six to eight to 12 hours into this process. You are burning the midnight oil. People have went to sleep. You know, you're, you're, it's you and yourself alone, and you are, you are in. You are convic convicted to finish building this thing. And you are on step 972 of 973. And you are almost done, and you're looking for part, you know, 476, and it's not there. This brand new piece of furniture, this brand new piece, toy, whatever it might be, does not, it's missing a piece. It's brand new, but it's broken. And that same thing, you know, in this new world, it's going to happen. We are going to come into this new world, and we're broken. The world's new. The world's perfect. God's there with us but we're broken. But you know what? He's going to fix us. He's going to make us new. Just like this toy or this piece of furniture, he's going to take all the pieces that are missing and he's going to make us whole and he's going to fix us. So let's watch how this passage, how the passage continues to reinforce this. It says, He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Now, we stop for a moment and think. You know, the fact that it says, you know, from God himself, basically, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. The fact they want us to write this down and make note of it makes me think, boy, this is pretty important. We probably need to pay attention to what the next part of this passage says. So let's kind of keep that in mind as we look at this next part. And it says, he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Now, when I read that in preparation, I thought, hmm, that sounds familiar like some other phrase I'd heard in the Bible. Anybody got any ideas? Very good. So, our Lord and Savior on the cross towards the end of his life as he's dying for you and I for our sins for our evils for our unworthiness he says it is finished and here the Lord through Apostle John says it is done and the good news the great news of this the great news that this statement is made is that the end the beginning of this new world it can start right now it's not something we have to wait for it's not something that's going to happen that might happen that dear lord i hope it happens oh no he's victorious the fight is over he has promised it is done the new world can start right now now as christians 
there's some, you know, our thoughts get kind of messed up on this and we kind of get confused. Because in our world, in our, our, our world as believers, we think, you know, we're going to live life and struggle through life and deal with sin and continue to pray and believe in God and make it through life. And then at some point we're going to pass away and at some point we're going to go to heaven. But the beauty of this is, the beauty of the fact that this battle is over, that it's finished, and that we have promised to us, and it's going to happen, that there will be a new world, is that you, as believers in Jesus, as believers in Him as your Savior, and believers in God, you can live in that perfect world right now because you know that in the end, it will be there for you. It'll be a brand new world, a perfect world. So... And setting up the next part of the passage, you know, the fact that we know, you know, it's over and it's won. Well, how does that happen? You know, we know he's won the battle. We know in the end it can start now. We know that it's perfect and we can live there. But how does that work? Why? How do we get that? So as you think about the next passage, as we get into it, I want to set a stage here. I want you to think about, you know, Ohio summers in July. When it's not raining, it's 140,000 degrees, humidity's like 98, you are sweating as you wake up, you're sweating in the cold shower, you just are sweating standing in front of the air conditioner. And you're in this heat and you're outside because you need to weed the garden. And you're weeding the garden and you're sweating. Or you're outside and you're running around chasing the kids. Or you're going for a hike. Or you're walking in the desert. That same kind of just hot, humid, arid, dry and the worst part of it is the worst part of all is there's no water there is absolutely nothing to drink you are just dying of thirst you want nothing more than a cold glass of water and the verse continues and it says to the thirsty i will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life The awesome part here is he gives water to the thirsty. And it's not the thirsty because it's hot. It's the thirsty that want the Lord and Savior. And he gives it from the spring of the water of life. I I think back to the story of the Samaritan lady. At the well, midday, she's drawing water. And the Lord and Savior Jesus comes to her and talks to her about water from the spring of life. Uses it metaphorically to give her the idea that She can always not be thirsty because the Lord will give her the water from the spring of the water of life. So, we've all been to movies. I'm I'm, I'm assuming at some point. We've all been to good movies. You know, we've all been fun. We've all been to bad movies. You know, and it's never, it's never, oh, I'm an hour and 45 minutes in. It's okay, kind of getting bad. Oh, no, you're 10 minutes in. You're 10 minutes in to a three-hour movie, but... You know, you aren't getting up. You paid like $4 million to get that ticket and get this ticket, and you aren't getting up. You are sitting right here and watching this bad movie, and no matter what you're going to do. But you know what? For all of us, I think, you know, the one thing about whether it's a good movie or a bad movie that makes it worth it is what? Now, I got a hint here. Hey! (laughs) It's the popcorn. Isn't the popcorn always awesome? You know, and you go up, you know, and you're adding the butter, and, you know, maybe you sneak a little drink of it just because it's great, you know. <laughs> and, you, and you get the big box, you know, because you get the free extra large one that you can either get in the movie or take home. Now, the only problem is, you know, the tickets cost $4 million. The popcorn costs like $2 million, and a right arm, a left arm, and your firstborn. That's all. But it's good popcorn. So, you know, what I want you to think about, though, is, you know, we, what if? What if, you know, we probably go to the movies a lot more, but what if when you go to the movies, you got free popcorn? Uh, Woo! Hey! (laughs) Brother! The awesome part about that is that's what God does for all of us who believe. He gives us the best stuff. He gives us the free popcorn. He gives us eternal life he gives us heaven here on earth he gives us the new world he comes and lives with us and walks with us and talks with us 
the best stuff, the most expensive stuff, the stuff that you and I can only dream of owning, he's already paid the bill for. He sent his son who died on the cross for you and I so that someday we can live in that new world and experience that stuff. And if, you accept, if you've accepted the Lord as your Savior and you live that life, the next part of this verse is really for you. And it says, those who are victorious will inherit all this. And I will be their God and they will be my children. So, I got a real simple question. Where are you? Where are you? Is God your God? Is Jesus your Lord and Savior? He wants nothing more than for us to be his children. And, and I can't even, you know, being a leader in our children's ministry, personally, I want nothing more than to see every kid that we deal with, every kid that's upstairs in that room right now, develop, grow, and have a strong, unbreakable, everlasting relationship with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and to live their life knowing and loving and being a child of God and go out and tell everyone else the wonderful news. And I can't even begin to think if I feel that way on this earth, how our Lord and Savior feels about us. He wants us to be victorious. He already fought the battle. He already sent his son. He already fought Satan. He's already won. It's already over with. He wants us to be his children. He wants the sin to be gone. He wants the brokenness to be gone. He wants us to live in a perfect place. But the text continues, and it offers a very scary and a very somber warning. And it says, But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who have practiced magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars. Now, just for a moment of levity, I'm happy because for the second time I've read this correctly. As I was practicing, I kept in saying, instead of saying, I did a rotters. And I just want you to know that I have nothing against people that might ride sleds in Alaska behind dogs. I didn't realize I was saying it. I would just say it, and you realize, oh, well, that doesn't sound right. Something's wrong there. So I'm quite happy now for the second time I've read that correctly. But this list, this list is not an extensive and exhaustive list. What this list is, is an example, a warning, that for those that choose to do it their way, those that know better, those that can do it better, those that don't need God. This is what they get instead of choosing Jesus. And in the last few words of the verse, as the verse continues, he says, and it's shown to us, for those that choose to do it their own way, those that choose to live that kind of life, it tells us what will happen to them. And it says, though they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Now, this isn't trying to frighten you to the point that, oh boy, man, I don't want to die a second time. I think dying once is going to be enough. I better accept this guy, Jesus, into my life. That's not at all what it's trying to do. What it's trying to do is just tell you there are consequences, and this is the consequence, if you are, choose to do life your own way. If you choose to go through life making your own decisions, and you don't trust in the Lord, your Savior, to guide you through life and to be there for you when you need Him. You know, hell's a real place. You know, and our God is a very just God who's going to deal with everyone. He's going to judge everyone. And you're either going to be judged as a child of God that believes in Jesus who covered your sins, or you're going to be judged as a person who lived life on their own, who did it their own way, who did it how they thought they should do it. 
and the truth, but the truth in the end is really this. This fiery lake, the lake that's described in this passage, is not for you. Amen. This lake, it was created for Satan and the fallen angels that had joined with him to rise up against God. God, because he wants us as his children, does not want us to be in this lake. He never intended us to be in this lake. God intended us to live in a perfect place that he is going to make new with him for the rest of eternity. And he intended it very simple. And so for one final time, for the last time, here's the truth. Here's the whole point. Just like these apocalyptic movies we've been watching, the world is going to end. It's going to come to an end whether we want it to or not. But God, our loving Savior, does not want it to end for us. He wants us to have the best stuff. He wants us to enjoy the free popcorn. He wants us to have eternal life, perfection, heaven, and a wonderful new world living with him. And all we have to do, all we have to do is believe. Believe in his son as our savior and accept the free popcorn, accept the free water. Let it quench our thirst for him. You know, and for me, I don't know, as I said earlier, I don't know your lives. I don't know what's going on. But for me, this is great news. You know, I can stand up here and I can smile and I can joke and I can tell you how much I love your kids and how much I love you and how much this is, you know, I, I love the Lord Jesus Christ. For me, it's been a tough year. You know, we've had two grandparents pass away this year. My sister, or my wife lost a brother of uh, some troubling circumstances. And recently, we've had some medical diagnosis in our immediate family that could be pretty devastating. But you know what? I can stand up here, and I can smile, and I can be happy because I love a Lord and Savior that died on a cross for me and a God that has fought a battle and he's won, and it's over, and someday I'm going to live in a perfect life, perfect place with my grandparents and my wife's brother and everybody else because we love a Savior that's going to make it that way for us. Amen? Amen. So, Lord, I, I thank you. I thank you for being a loving God and a justful God. I thank you for sending your son to die for me on the cross. I thank you for promising me a new and a perfect world, Lord. And I ask that for those here that do not know you, Lord, to soften their heart of stone, to let them know that there are people here that will get with them, will pray with them, and will let them bring the Lord Jesus Christ into their heart, that someday they too can be a part of this perfect world. Lord, I thank you for this time. I thank you for the people that are in this place. In your loving son's name I pray. Amen.